Oh, really? All right, hello, people. Uh, what's even showing on here? I genuinely can't tell if the audio is going. Oh, it actually is. Got to see. Yay. Minor aside about club leadership. Yes, we need more people because there are three of us right now, and two of us are going to just vanish into the ether at the end of May. So we need time to train people so that it's not a total train wreck. You know what happens? when club admins just graduate without telling their like people that they picked anything. It's what happened to like me and the other cohort previously. We got rug pulled and we had to basically rebuild the entire club. So we're trying to not do that. We're trying to give people the resources that they need to actually do it. Ugh, fancy slides. And not have Zoom settings. So general breakdown of what we as leaders tend to do. Obviously, presenting at meetings, it's literally this. It's being on the other side of it. Also, trying to come up with presentation topics and making slides and resources for it, because it's not hard, it's not hard for you. I put in way too much effort into making resources for these slides. I make custom memes for them. But like, it's not like more work than it should be. Yeah. If you don't worry about the Yes, hopefully it's worth work that you actually enjoy and already know stuff about. So there's also outreach. We have like there are events on campus like Press Start that they hold with CU Gaming, as well as Be Involved Fair that we go and host tables at and talk to people. And yeah, that sounds like a nightmare if you're a developer like me, but sometimes you just put up with it so that we can get more club members. And then we also for this semester specifically, we make flyers to put up in things and other ways of kind of getting the word out and letting people know that we exist because people do not know that we exist a lot of the time. That's even when people show up to the table at the events, that's one of the comments that they have is like, I didn't know this club existed. As well as logistics, there's usually one person who handles logistics, it me, I'm the logistics person right now. I'll be the next logistics person, so y'all have to learn more. So yeah, this is kind of like the minutia that I will be passing on here, but like we, we coordinate a lot of the scheduling as well as this room and making sure that we don't get deleted by the university because the university wants you to register every semester for some reason. Well, not every semester, every year and go to this little like training on like, here's how you talk to people about funding and we have not gotten funding. Most we have is a coupon for a free print job, and I have no idea what we would do because we already printed the flyers. That's a bit late. But yeah, that's essentially what we do. Also, tomfoolery. This is a very important tenet, and I'm keeping it on the slide because I don't want people to forget that being funny is valuable. Why is it not that fancy? Okay. And then just some things to consider if you're interested. This this sounds really ominous as far as time commitment, but like it's not. The only reason that we really put this on here is because we had one club admin who literally just stopped showing up and was playing heck and war thunder during like club time instead of showing up. Like, don't do that, and you'll be fine. As well as, you know, just do you want to present on this stuff? As well as, hey, it demonstrates that you're not socially inept. And can actually talk in front of people, which is definitely something that in talking with employers they want. At least in some places, it's like especially places that do consulting that are like, you're going to have to talk with the, our clients. And they kind of impress that upon you because I get the feeling a lot of developers like, wait, I have to talk to people for this job. I was promised technical skills. But that's a skill that you can have on account of I, I talk to people for like an hour a lot of weeks, as well as also tomfoolery. And that's the end of this slide. It's three slides. Now to the actual presentation that was actually teased with the topic. Design patterns. This is a topic that is way more complicated than we're going to go into right now, but when we talk about design in this presentation, it's the same word, but it's referring to systems design, which is actually how you go about your implementation rather than the whole, like, if you've ever gone on a rabbit hole of watching Game Maker's Toolkit, they're always like big high-flying ideals of this is what the game should make you feel and experience. And that's game design, that's not this. 
this is the more nitty gritty because we haven't really gone into the nitty gritty of actual game development in the game development club all that much. And I'm trying to remedy that a little bit. So design patterns, what are they? They are literally just this principle, but in a more formalized form. So like there are some problems that a lot of developers have had. So people have developed kind of canonical solutions to them and then they get enshrined in these little design pattern thingies. And then you can just implement them in your project and you know that they're going to work because we have like decades of developers using them to iron out all the kinks. And this also helps us with questions like these to which the answers are not necessarily obvious. Or maybe they are obvious. Are these obvious to people? Do you see an obvious way of making this work? I'll take the blank stairs as a no. That's why we have design prof. So yeah, this is also runs parallel to the general idea of, well, some people have designed specific systems for doing specific things, and you can just use those and save yourself a lot of time and money. You don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel here when the wheel is already there. Just put it on. Unless you are. Literally the entire capstone project that I'm doing for one of my degrees is reinventing the wheel on one of these things. I don't know why. But, but yeah, the only real caveat here is that they're not a cure-all like some people act like they are. Some people try to build entire projects just from design patterns and not use anything else. And that gets clunky and has a lot of overhead because just from the way that these things are designed, that gets pretty clunky. So it's more tools for the toolbox, basically as well as some useful patterns that are cherry picked here. This is not nearly all of them because there are a whole bunch of these, maybe like 20 or so that were developed by this one software engineer who wrote a book like 10 years ago and gave them all these weird names. And that's why the names are weird. But in case you, in, in case you come across these in the development context, I did want to use the original names in case people are using the original names. But yeah, I'll go through these in the subsequent slides. So first off, we have Observer. This is one which is essentially automatically implemented for you by any game engine that has an event system. This is where you're able to essentially trigger an event from one piece of code and then have that event call code in another completely unrelated object without having a reference between the two, because reference wrangling is difficult. And we don't want to do that. So this generally just makes it a bit easier to notify other objects of things that happen. So in this case, this is I have this little signal set up in Godot, which is the same thing, but like they just use signals instead of events, different terminology for different folks. So it's literally just the one signal for when we're restarting the game. And then in two different objects here, we have using that thing to do different code in there is to kind of you know, reset their states back to what they should be when we're restarting. And this would be a nightmare to do if we had to actually track down references to the player and everything else that has to be handled using this one thing. So that's really the strength of it, is it lets you notify things about things that are happening in the system without having to have a reference. What very verbose, I know. So the real weakness here is that it's kind of just a one-off thing rather than something that you can call continuously and pass data through. Some implementations of Observer let you pass through data, but not always. So that's not really a reliable thing that you can count on for this. So if you need to, say you wanted to use an event for, if you destroy one of the enemies and it needs to update the score counter on how much score, then it wouldn't be able to pass around that amount and you'd need to get it to it another way, yes? Would this include like function um, pointer type thing where like it'll call us something? Or is it just like go to the code? Different implementations do it different ways. So like But that would be a weekend. That that is the way that Unity does it actually, where if you define a Unity action, then the way that you assign some function to get called when that Unity action is called is you literally take the like name of that unity action because it's always static and then you literally plus equals the function reference for the thing. I don't know why unity made it like that, but that's how it works. 
Next up, we have object pools. This is one that I used a lot in the project that is technically due on Thursday. So this is technically in development. But the whole idea with object pool is that we have a set of objects and we don't have to instantiate or delete them. So we don't have to deal with the performance cost of instantiating and spinning up and deleting things. We just have these things that get shifted around as we need them. And that's exactly what's happening here, where anytime, like it, this whole parallax layer is literally just these eight objects. And then one time, anytime one of these goes off the end of the screen, then it'll just get warped back to the other end of the same stack and it'll keep moving, kind of like a conveyor belt. But that is a kind of performant way of doing it as opposed to just spawning and destroying and worrying about references for all that. And the primary weakness with this is that there's a limit to how many objects you have in the pool. And if you have to keep expanding the pool by adding more objects, then you kind of defeated the point of having a pool of objects to begin with, as well as sometimes the code for making the transitions between these seamless can be a little bit of a challenge as it was for this parallax. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, this is like what's happening when, uh, for example, when people like go out of bounds that can be what's happening yeah sometimes sometimes like you need a place to put the objects in the pool when they're not in use and usually that place is just beneath the ground where you would never look because a lot of the objects get they're not like initialized but they're just sets of zero to like signify like oh this isn't a valid object but it's still in them like, that would be your question yeah um like how much performance hits is like instantiated in like deleting objects like at the object at the end? That depends on the object. Um, performance when you get low level, you can't improve it unless you mess with them. Like memory is like the highest overhead when it comes to like the lowest performance. Of the there's really? that. There's that part, and then there's the part of it where. Like, sure, the actual instantiation process isn't necessarily the slowest thing in the world, but all of the code that you have to write and run in order to actually initialize it is a significant performance here. Yeah, is it, so is it ever worth like doing like an object pool, like projectiles or something like that? Like, in terms of like the purpose of like the user. Like, yeah, that's, that's one way of doing a lot of projectiles. I have another way of doing a lot of projectiles in this very presentation, but you could also do it with object pool. But isn't object pool mainly used for like big objects? Like big as in like a lot, like that's what that's like. Sometimes you can also use it for smaller objects, but for smaller objects, it just slightly decreases the amount of value that it offers you. But sometimes you might want to do that for other reasons. Like I had done it for like a little simulation where you're tossing balls in VR and you need like it already has an object pool for those like ball objects that you're spawning because you're not actually spawning them, but it also lets you keep track of how many of them you've thrown and like game over stuff. Mm -hmm. So it also just lets you plug in other functionality on top of it if you want. Same with any of these is that they can be modified. Yeah, remember not 30 seconds ago when I said there was another way of doing a lot of shots? This is the other way of doing a lot of shots. On the... <laughs> Right here, we have a screenshot from, I think this is Toho 11, but just to give you an idea of how insane these games get with how many, how, how do you spawn that many objects? The answer is you don't. And the actual way that you don't is you use a flyweight. A flyweight is essentially, you have what is essentially a template of that object. And since every other version of that object is going to act identically to it, you just keep an internal list of the relevant data that you need to have for all of those instances instead of actually instantiating them as objects. And then you just run the simulation over all of them from that one template object instead of having to worry about spawning and respawning a whole bunch of things for this. So like, that's something that I noticed in actually watching the gameplay footage to get this screenshot is that literally all of these bullets, the only thing that's different is the angle that they're moving at and maybe the speed. Otherwise, they all act completely identical. There are just a lot of them. So when you need to simulate it, you could just have the game go through and 
normally where you would have an object with an update loop for like, oh, move this object. Instead, you could have the flyweight get to that point and say, okay, instead of moving this specific template object, I am going to go through my list of the relevant data for like the simulated duplicates here and then just run the small amount of movement code on all of them, if that makes sense, and then like render them. Does that make sense? This one's kind of weird to talk about. It's kind of like a super prefab, but it actually controls the behavior of all of its children because its children aren't physically present. Kind of like a puppet master. I'm trying to think about like the collisions because like, if you hit like say like the third level or something, would it technically hit every single other on the same one? Or like how does collision work for all of these? I'm thinking like maybe it just checks like because all of them are like equal angles. So I wonder if you just check one point and then update that point and then check it there and go around. I feel like if you're doing collision for this, you could probably some find some optimization for like only sample the parts of this that are closest to the player so that you could like only go through a sub portion of like the list of duplicate objects but you would essentially go through that smaller list of duplicate objects and just check whatever like if they have an associated position statistic in their little data entry so like for each of these bullets if you have I keep referring to this imaginary table of like data for the duplicate objects. So each of these would probably have like an angle as well as just the position that it's currently at, maybe a speed, and just those three data points in an array row. And then that array is just like for all of these, because array access is very quick and you could probably use array doubling or whatever for it. But then that would be a lot less memory like read and writes than actually all of the backend stuff that the game engine needs to actually have a proper object with just those three fields and then the behavior. Other questions on flyweight? All right. Model view controller. This one's kind of redundant, but I felt the need to include it because this, <laughs> you might notice you have a model of the objects that are in the game. You have control code, for what happens with those objects in the game, as well as a view to display those objects in the game. And you might be thinking based off of these three visuals, hey, that sounds like every game engine ever. Yes, every good game engine ever. <laughs> it's, engines are basically this personified. This is mostly one that was developed for software that doesn't necessarily have all this stuff built in for like if you're building from like if you're manually making windows, then the window that you're making would be more of the view component, but it essentially just breaks down responsibilities between like what stuff gets run by the view for handling repositioning and scaling things as opposed to doing that in the actual control code. So just dividing up things to make sure that things are done where they need to be rather than just in one massive file that's like 10,000 lines long, which is impossible to debug. I don't know, this was a bad example, but mentioned it for completeness. Singleton. Singleton is a bit situational. It is an entire class that exists for when you need one and only one of something. Otherwise, it turns into an object pool. <laughs> but it's essentially a smaller object pool for only one object and the whole point of this is like if you have a bunch of objects that want access to a thing then you don't have to worry about which one of those have it spawned and which one of those don't you can just like have them call a function for get the instance and then the actual singleton object is the thing that manages that instance and really the only utility that I found for this one in games was like some games require you to declare an object for like a random number generator. And if you want to specifically see that, or if you want to turn off the RNG for debug purposes, then having it in one place with everything's references being properly resolved to that one thing can be really helpful. So if you're doing like Minecraft spawning and you have a specific like string that you're using as the random seed, then you don't have to worry about 
actually plugging that into the engine every single time that you want to access a random. This is good for just global data in general because you don't want multiple instances. Like for me, I use like a single template for like the matrix API. I, like it'll be access into like the main file, but then you don't want it instantiated anywhere else. So they can all call to that one single data form. All right, moving away from the specific design patterns and then more to the idea of delegation, which this is more of the helpful thing that I think would be for development, is that delegation is specifically making objects that do one or two things very well and independently, independently being the important idea, because previously when I talked about like reference wrangling, this is a way of cutting down on that where you essentially make these little self-contained units that are able to do their job without having to worry about what the rest of the system is doing so that not only can they do it in a more durable way, but they're also able to be reused because they no longer care about context. And this is the, this is the fancy computing term for that is coupling is how much it depends on other parts of the system, how hooked in it is. Like, I guess the general analogy for this is if you have a bunch of if you have your component and it has a bunch of wires that need to be connected to other parts of the system, that would be a lot of coupling versus just having the one box that maybe takes an HDMI out and an input or something, then that would be a lot easier to wrangle and a lot more reusable because you don't have to worry about having all the different ports that that thing needs. It's also nice for like extending your code. If you don't have a lot of coupling, and you change one option, like object, you'll be able to like, it won't change like pivotals, but if you change, like if it's highly coupled, if you change like maybe the name of a variable, it'll break everything. Yeah. And then it's like harder to repack. Yeah, so this was an example just in general for like, this was how I did the parallax scrolling for that game I mentioned previously is that it just has this script specifically for doing parallax scrolling and nothing else with all of the like object pool recycling and stuff built into it. And if you want to advance it, then you literally just call these two functions for like, if you, this is for when you're actually doing the little interpolation for moving things forward. And then this one for, is for once you actually get done with the interpolation and you want it to update and loop all those objects back. These are the two functions that you need to call. And that's a lot better than actually having to go through a for loop and all that in your code that does other things. So examples of this, I also had that parallax scrolling in here as a fourth example, but there are other things in here. So getting that substitution portion here, this was a thing that I had made where it's basically a version of Pac-Man, but the AI is encapsulated in a little like object rather than being just part of the runner code. So you can actually swap that object out thanks to the magic of object-oriented programming. You can hot swap it on the fly during gameplay. So like this screenshot excludes the UI where the UI has a little timer on it for like ghost AI switches in like 11 seconds. And then when that timer hits zero, they all change and they can change to whatever you want them to be. The two settings that I had were um, you can randomize them or if you want to just jump scare the player, you can also just have them all be the most aggressive setting for a couple seconds. So that was definitely a thing that you can do. And it's not something that you would normally do if you have that just in a standard update loop. But hot swapping ghost AI is a lot more fun than I thought it was going to be when like this project started. As well as health bars, this is the reusing part of it that I had mentioned previously, where it's literally the same script that's attached to two different objects and it just kind of works because it doesn't actually depend on all that much. The only things that it really depends on are like, we need to know what things that we're gonna render for the little sections of it because it's a discretized one, as well as the actual thing that we're rendering to, and that's it. Uh, these are all the dependencies. It's just three of them. And then it's just kind of some basic stuff. There are also some other functions here, but notice how this doesn't like try to go out and look for game objects of like, game object dot find with this name or whatever, as I had pre in previous projects. And that was a nightmare to debug. And also it, this one just let me use the same script on both the player and enemy 
ones. And that was very nice because anytime you don't have to write your same code twice is a victory. It's kind of plug and play, isn't it? You just like anything you want to hook for. Oh, you just yeah, it just works. And and you can actually swap the order. Like the two health bars that I have up here, one of them goes from left to right, and one of those goes right to left. And that's just solely based off of the order that the little slots are in like when they're children. It'll just go through in whatever order you defined it is. And you don't even have to define it in here. So that's real nice. Same token with dying. This is this gets more into the weeds of like actual object oriented programming where there's just this general class that I had made for like death handlers and it does all of the work of calling these two functions based off of interpolation for whatever you want to interpolate. And got to use that same base class in order to make smaller classes for the player and enemies to do different things with it. Like the player restarts the game whenever you lose all your health. And the enemies, it has a little physics ragdoll because they're all like cardboard cutouts and I wanted to have them comically fall over when you defeat them for comedy value. And it lets you have vastly different code in those, but when you see up here, it actually doesn't care which one it is. This doesn't reference like an enemy death handler, it just represents death handler in general. And because C sharp is object oriented, it just like looks for that and does things based off of whatever is defined in the base class versus overrides and then all that. I, I should probably ask before I go any further with this, like how much how much experience do people have with object-oriented programming? Should I explain that? Is that, is that a term that people have heard? Yeah. All right, cool. So the idea is that normally with like, kind of Python script type programming, you have like code that you run over in linear fashion with some data that represents whatever it is you're doing. And that's fine for a lot of applications, especially scripting when you need to just kind of spitball something real fast and then run it without having to go through a whole build process. Object oriented is really nice for, it has the idea of objects and objects have like little functions or things that they can do as well as data. And then the idea behind all this is kind of having a couple of responsibilities on one object as opposed to a bunch of responsibilities. And then you establish a network of objects that communicate with each other. So the whole thing that's going on here is that you can create kind of a general, more general template object. That would be the generic death handler here. Or you know what, I might as well just show the actual code for this instead of trying to just gesture into the air. But you create kind of a default template one. Yes, it keeps, it keeps and displays a little count of how long you have stared at the secret rock. <laughs> I don't know why I added that. But yeah, this is the generic one where it doesn't actually have any code in these functions, but things are able to call them. And because of the whole idea, like one of the core tenets of object-oriented programming is that you can overwrite things. So this is the default. This is like the basic one that you're supposed to change when you make a specific one. Then when you go into the specific one, then you actually have proper implementations for these functions. And essentially what the system does is it looks for, like we have an object that's an instance of this, but the actual like reference that it's using in the other one is just looking for generic death handler. So it looks for a death handler and technically because this is extending that one as like a little subtype, then it is it does technically fall under that umbrella of yes, this is technically a death handler. It's just a slightly different one then it just accepts that and goes through. And initially it'll look through any of these to see if they override. And override is like, if this version, like if this function also exists in the generic, uh, disregard the one in the generic and just run this one because specific beats general. And it's essentially just being able to make a version of the base one that does the same things, but 
with the difference of it wants to do a different thing. Shut up about UCB wireless. I don't care. Shut the heck up. Just shut up, please. Let me do my presentation. Anyway. But essentially what this is saying is like, yes, we are a subtype. So if we don't have an implementation for something in this subtype, just use the version that's in the generic. But if there is one in here, then use the one in here because we're trying to do a specific version of it. So we can have two different specific versions of it that have different implementations for these. And if one of them just doesn't implement hurt for AMP, for instance, then it'll default back to the version in here that has no body and just do nothing. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Like, say you have like an enemy that you want to encode, you can literally just like inherit from like, say you wanted to have a like, physics, you can inherit from like a physics body and it'll just auto, like, actually already have that. You can inherit from like a um, position, like, and then you can make code and share it across multiple. Let's say you have like an array of a bunch of like random enemy types. Well, random like and really any object type, but they all inherit from like um, physics. You can just call update on all of them. It doesn't care about a specific type as long as it inherits from the physics. Yeah, cool. So yeah, that's that kind of. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah, I mean, I have some prior knowledge about it. I'll just ask this question to do with the video. So, <laughs> I mean, aren't we all here? Isn't that the reason that we're that we're here in this club is to make video games? For whatever definition of that. I mean you just like to have more experience. Apologies if we over explain. Do I have a tendency to over explain, or at least I do. All right. This is the same thing that I had mentioned previously, but it's literally the same script with different parameters. And these are this is a thing that I had mentioned at the beginning of the meeting where it just lets you put a little flag on a variable and then it'll display in the actual editor. So you can modify these on a per instance basis when you've actually put them in the scene, which is really nice. So you can just have these, like these, this is the only thing that really changes between the three layers that we have defined here is just like, they have a slightly different multiplier on how much of the original scroll speed that they go at for like, you want one to move slower to give that more, more of a perspective look. That's just what that modifier does. And then the step length is just the thing for this specific implementation, because if you'll notice this like third layer here, as well as the first two layers, they're using different size sprites here with a different width between them. And that's, that's how that is like, those top two layers use the same width because it's literally the same sprite but a different color. And then this one uses a different one because the buildings are wider. And then that's the only change. We got to reuse the same code without writing it twice. So there's a lot, there's a lot of programming laziness in there. And laziness is not something to necessarily be ashamed of because it gives you more time to focus on the things that actually matter like designing juice into your games. Juice is a term, have people heard that term? Also gets referred to as game feel. So it's essentially all of the things that you implement in order to make your game feel good to play. This includes like making things bounce around or particle effects or screen shake or sound is definitely a big component of this as well as just generally making things not completely like static. The general principle with juice is like get the maximum amount of reaction from the game for the minimum amount of input. So even something like, I don't know, what's a basic action? Something like Celeste's jump where it has this whole little squash and stretch on your character sprite just from jumping. And they probably did that to mask the fact that there's not technically a jump animation, but whatever, it's also it also looks really nice and honestly looks better than if they had put in a traditional jump animation and not done that. But like, it just feels real good. It's it's deep in your lizard brain and it lets you make your game feel more fun than it should reasonably be based off of the mechanics. So curve objects are really nice. They're a really nice thing that a lot of modern game engines have added to let you do this. It's literally an object that takes in a number between zero and one and then it'll output uh, an output number 
based off of whatever curve that you've edited with like they have these nice little Bezier curve editors that you can put things into for like if you want this one here as it actually has it shoot over one and then come back to it for like a little 1.5 this is I use this for like doing a little squash on the player sprite when they get hit so it's a more general indicator as well as this one for just like grow a little bit before coming back down for like if you're doing a little like boy beam kind of thing but these can be used for a whole lot of things because it's just number in number out and then you can take that number out and put it into literally whatever you want that can be a whole presentation in and of itself but yeah questions on this one If anyone would like more information on this topic, there's a lovely little video in the resources on using curves to add personality to stuff like procedural animation, because you can just define a curve for this. And based off of how you define that curve, it'll have a different feel. Or like if it's just a linear, then it'll feel kind of very robotic moving here. Is that phrase? Do you want to No, that's the one on like, the one with the little four-legged robot. Oh, I see that one. Yeah, that one. that one. It's this. <laughs> but if you want to learn more about like splines and like curves and stuff, Freya uh, the Fulmer on YouTube is like doing a curve video on splines. It's an hour and thirteen minutes long video, but it it's really cool. Yeah, curves can do a whole lot just from this one. It's it's deceptively simple just based off of what you can do with it. Like, say we wanted to move this stapler from here to here. We could have it have a whole different feel if we wanted to move linearly, which has one feel as opposed to like actually having acceleration versus if we want to have like a little follow through at the end for like you really want it to feel weighty, have a little like kind of wiggly fall off there as, as it looks like on the curve. The videos go into more detail on how you can do that, but that's just a general idea of what you can achieve with these. Oh, yes. That's the end of the presentation 20 minutes before the end. So uh, that's about all I had for this presentation. Things people would like to hear more about. If they are using it, they're probably using it under the hood and they're not going to tell you about it. Like, Unity's not going to come up and say we're using the observer pattern. They're just going to say, he, Here's our uh, here's our nice little event system that we definitely came up with and invented ourselves. Use it, <laughs> even though it's literally the same thing under the hood. So, like in terms of offering like default templates for these, they don't really. There are sources that you can look at for like a default implementation of these. I could also try to explain a default implementation for some of these. Well, some of the weirder ones like Flyweight were more difficult because despite taking object oriented like last semester, I don't remember all of it. I think we have a really good thing this is work stuff, but I don't really need to like actually review all of this. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen Flyweight in like an actual game. Yeah. Uh, that was just my inkling off of like how you would even do a performant version of But ECS is like an every like entity component system is in almost any game. Yeah. Except Godot, you know, it just does a different version of that. Yeah, ECS or entity component is generally a way that you do the, the delegation thing, where the entire idea of a component is that it's a thing that does one thing, which is why you have a transform component and a collider component and your movement and your like like your renderer or something. And those are all different components and they all have exactly one job. Which is in the name, ideally. Oh yeah, sure. You want to do that? Well, yeah.
The slides will be posted, right? Oh yeah, slides and the recording, because we we actually figured out how to Zoom record. If you notice those dumb little Zoom settings uh, on the top uh, right, yeah. Finally, fill in on every thirty minutes. I use come out. I mean, not everybody can make the meeting times because the meeting times are kind of dumb with in-person things. That's kind of, that's the cardinal rule with like running any tabletop RPG is that you cannot, you physically cannot get six people in a room together at the same time with scheduling. <laughs> Like, if you want to, like, instance of, like, have, like, one instance of a tree or something for a forest that, like, every tree is, like, every tree share shares the same data as that one tree, like, is that something that a lot of editors make easy, or do you have to get kind of happy with it? So, you're meaning, like, having a whole bunch of duplicates of that object that all have the same data? Yeah, so you can, like, share that. That's, that's basically the canonical example for a flyweight pattern. And I imagine that's what Unreal is doing with its whole like forest system of like, ooh, whole like drag to make a bunch of trees. And we somehow made this performant. I, I have a very strong <laughs> inkling that the somehow is flyway. Only like with low level bit shifting or whatever kind of stupid optimization stuff that they did, I swear. The amount of optimi the optimization nerds definitely have a thing for like either Unreal or even if you go into certain programming circles. Like if you've ever read books like Cracking the Coding Interview, they get into like bit manipulation for solving basic pet programming problems. Like no, Gail, <laughs> I want to make my code readable to someone who isn't on a 78th grade optimization level, all right? Go work for AMD if you want to optimize things to that level. You're out here using SIMD on some random like program that does not use. Yeah, that's about all I had. We're at about like 45 right now. I don't want to hold people if they have other things that they need to do. And boy, are there a lot of things to do at this point in the semester. I am wondering though what I can do to kind of help people more. This is kind of an effort to try and give more helpful resources and such rather than just like, oh, we're all doing design presentations and stuff. And it's another lecture that you got to go to on top of all the other lectures, but this one you choose to go to. Like what do people want to hear about, honestly? I do know there's a thing on like skeletal and I'm trying to research that. I've not gotten around to it because there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Been a bit busy, but there are some like kind of visual resources that I've found for games that do skeletal really well in certain ways. Probably the two recommendations that I found for that were like Fate Grand Order and any game in the Super Robot Wars series. I would consider Super Robot Wars to be like the gold standard for skeletal animations just because of the things they're able to pull off with it. And it's still all 2D. Like, they don't even go to 3D models for it. But yeah, other things that people would like to hear about, especially people who have not been volunteering questions in the back. Yes, y'all. <laughs> Come on, people, help me help you. <laughs> I'm willing to make a Google form that people can like have as a suggestion box or make a Discord channel for it if that would be more helpful or like just make the Google form anonymous so we don't even knew, have to know who suggested it. Just like we need suggestions because coming up with a topic every week is difficult, deceptively so. A lot of the presentations end up being about design topics because it's just like random game design shower thoughts. Yes. Um, well, on that note of like, and let somebody design all these things. Um, this is hopefully like less of that. Um, you have the slide open for flyweight, and I like my mind thinks to like there's something analogous to this for like rendering huge amounts of things at once. Like I know uh, from Breath of the Wild, they used a trick where very very distant objects will often be rendered, and I know a lot of games probably do this, but like it'll be rendered. Was it like have a two D sprite because it's so far away? It's small enough to where you're not going to notice that it's not a full 3D model. 
or anything like what kinds of um, like even more probably speaking in terms of like design patterns might we follow when we're trying to like optimize rendering a lot of things that are either hard to notice or would otherwise be like too much performance put into something that has very little meaning. I think for that example, like, like you're mentioning, that would almost be something closer to like level of detail groups where like you could have, this is something that a lot of game engines let you define for like, you have your base asset with what it looks like from up close. And then you can define other like kind of basically groups that it can like change into with like slightly lower poly models as kind of like the, I don't know, the image that gets worse every, like every row or whatever until it's eventually just like a quad with a texture on it. This is something that's been a part of games for a very long time. They actually implemented this in like Mario 64. I was gonna say, yeah, was that's the thing. Like, when you said that example, I was immediately thinking to the example of Mario 64 where up close it's normal Mario and far away it's funny looking Mario. <laughs> yeah, they have that. And they also have that for like, if like, games take a lot of time to load. Like where's where's the example that I had made? There we go. No, it's is it here? Yeah, I'd make a little gif of this because the game actually took long enough to load that you can physically see the level of detail groups. Yeah. One of these is far higher poly than the other ones, but the other one is just used as a temp while the rest of the game is loading because this was made late into the switch's life cycle or at least midway so they kind of had to push the system limits a bit just to make everything work but yeah that's the general idea with lod groups is that you can save on resources when they're not going to notice the difference if that answers the question yes that gives a good idea okay cool you want you want to throw that out <laughs> Yeah. Ah. Let me just disconnect here. What is what is going to happen to the screen share if I disconnect here? All right. Ah. How is Zoom expert? This is a pretty simple example. I kind of like it might be too modular, but I don't know. Work. No. Uh. For anyone watching this recording, I apologize in advance if you're just seeing a black screen right now. Uh, I don't even think it worked because your Zoom. Yes, yeah, it's, it's my Zoom on here. You know, I could probably get like the meeting code for it or whatever. We have like don't 15 think, minutes I don't think left. that's worth it. Okay. Yeah, we got so like I 10 have... minutes left in this meeting. So I don't Can y'all see this? Is this too small? Kind of like, oh, okay. Voila. All right, cool. So this is very simple. I literally have an entity components dot h file that literally has like a graphics component, physics component, projectile, ray cast. So these are all like things like if I want to draw something, like if it has a sprite or if it has physics or is it a projectile, all that stuff. And like literally it's just a simple class that is protected instead of public and private and stuff. So it literally just like each of them have like one thing they do. Like physics literally just has, oh yeah, but yeah. So physics literally just has like the body, which uh, has anyone used like box 2D or anything? All right, cool. Well, this is just physics stuff. Um, it has like the getters and setters so you don't have to write this in every time you want to do something. So I can literally just, if I like look at the enemy, all I do is just public and inherit from all of these and it just has everything. I only have to like override three functions and everything works. That's kind of cool. And like literally, uh, I'm not sure if this is gonna work, but man, I forgot how big this file is. I got an update. Literally, so all enemies, they're um, <laughs> this is terrible, too. but literally all I do is call update and updates a um, physics. And projectile meant like it's literally, um, yeah. So it's a physics um, command, I believe, and then all this kind of cool. And you can, I've kind of made it like very low level. Well, not low level, but like very simply, like the true entity component component system like enables like a object pool, 
and all this. So like you can have your components in an object pool and they get assigned to your uh, like enemies or like anything you want it to do. So you don't have to like, um, you don't have to like multiply instantiate all, all that. It's kind of, does anyone have any questions about how they can implement? This is super easy. It's like plug and play. Kind of I got like five minutes. What about the topic they want to discuss next week? Well, you next week. Okay, wrap this thing or sign for sentences. My guy had not even planned your. Oh, yeah? I was going to ask. I have nothing in particular in mind, but I would like to express my interest in that general subject. How about it? Or um, like. Uh, you, you said the word graphics, and I said, oh, oh, okay. I want to I want to endorse. And that, I want to endorse that. Yeah. Favorite festival again. Should we literally just like five minutes last last week? Well, let me see. Yeah, yeah we did it pretty brief last time. Yeah. Uh, not strictly for next week, but just like maybe a topic would be like um, text based issues. So, like, the religion society, the one that um, someone was taking environmental protection for other things. But I really want to get into the structure of that. Oh, like ASCII graphics stuff? Sort of, yeah. I mean, it's not strictly just technical, but based. Mm -hmm. Like, not really like, like texture, texture, but like how, how you make um, different types of like graphics using uh, Yeah, yeah, that's true. I don't know if you touched on this, but I remember seeing a bit about like shaders. Yeah, I can do that. All right, so let's do graphics. Just do shaders. Yeah, that's also another solution to the whole like, how do we render a whole bunch of things? Like, the, if you've ever seen games that do a whole bunch of like dynamically swaying grass or whatever, and you wonder how they ever have the processing power to do that, it's compute shaders. Literally, the whole idea is you take a small little mesh and you put it through what should be a shader, but it's not technically rendering anything it just dupes that geometry a whole bunch yeah so the, the solution to drawing a lot of things is don't do it on cpu <laughs> make the make the graphics make the like graphics process in unity and on this job and on that whole breath of the wild example the other solution to drawing a lot of grass is don't draw a lot of grass and then make you make them think you are if you've noticed at the edge of the screen, you can kind of see that the grass is actually only drawn in a circle around you when it cuts out at a point where the camera can still see it, which is kind of awkward, but I don't begrudge them that. That's like one of two little bugs that I found in all of Breath of the Wild. The other one was one time I randomly came across a Ice Lizalfos T posing, and I have a screenshot of it. I don't know how that worked, but I've never seen that again. Have you ever played PUBG in like the early days where if you were too far away, perfectly fine to get sniped? Yeah, <laughs> and I love Force of Thunder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which one had Force Trump in that or Arma 2? Yeah. It's amazing how much of like they didn't even bother making content for Arma Three. It's just people making their own content for Arma Three at this point. I don't even know what they've done with the sorter. Honestly, I don't get how Bohemia like operates. It's so crazy that they just stumble upon like their community making like various genre defining like shooters, and then they're just like. Yeah, like Arma stems into Daisy, which stems into Burning Rust. Yeah, no, just like, the general building survival of the game job. Like, <laughs> and then you have your battle royale, like that also came out of the Arma ecosystem. Like, RP came out of Arma? Like, <laughs> it's fucking insane. Well, even I mean, even yeah, he wanted a lot, but.
and people mod it a lot. Like even within like you see completely custom ops that people have made, like for recreating events for Warhammer. And basically all of the assets and content for that op are custom made by community members. Like they didn't even have to do anything. The, the developers did not have to do anything. They pulled a valve. I'm not which one's worse. I'm a three or war thunder as a leaking Oh, I swear, like, like, we're like, on like the third one this month. Right? Yeah, like Arma 3's ops were like textbook. Like, this is exactly how it happens. And don't ever ask the developer how they do so. 